you're watching Gears. Brought to you by Holly Performance Products. Fuel your passion. And Cornwell Tools, the choice of professionals. There's no doubt that Pontiac was a major player in the development of the American muscle car. When the GTO hit the streets in 1964, it started the muscle car war that resulted in some of the greatest cars the world has ever seen. Then in the 70s, when things had died down and the streets were full of four-cylinder Pintos and Vegas and Gremlins, Pontiac struck again with a black and gold Trans Am driven by a bandit followed by a snowman. Well, the more wheels of God, the better I like it. I'm the brother of a truck driving mother. Boogity, 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 boogity. And chased by a Smokey. Daddy, the top came off. No <laughs> The resulting hysteria started the desire for American muscle all over again. The 80s was another hit for Pontiac as a new body style, equipped with futuristic intelligence, helped solve crimes on the small screen. Unfortunately, by the early 2000s, it was all over, as GM surprised the world by pulling the plug on Pontiac and not only killing the brand, but also putting an end to what was arguably their hottest car to date, the 98-02 LS-powered Trans Am. Now, why GM would decide to do something like that is anybody's guess, but it probably had something to do with the fact that these LS powered Trans Ams and the Camaro would run right with the Corvette back then. And that's not a real smart thing to do if you're part of the GM family. Yeah, so that eventually became bad news for Pontiac, but it's good news for us because now there are literally thousands of these cars out there used. They're still in good shape and they're affordable. The proof of that is sitting right here in front of you. Take a look. This is a well-worn 98 Trans Am that we picked up for a few thousand bucks. Now it has 160,000 miles on it, but it was well-maintained, so the motor is still strong. So that is a big plus. The body is really solid with no rust, no serious damage. Just the typical dings and cracks and scratches that you're going to find on a used car. The interior is surprisingly good with no rips in the seats or the door panels. And of course you have some cracks in the dash. The suspension and brakes on the other hand, <laughs> those are shot and everything is loose and sloppy and worn out. So this thing does not handle or stop very well. The stock wheels and tires are okay. But those never looked right on these cars because they were too small and skinny to handle what these cars were capable of, especially when it came to handling. So we're going to show you how easy it is to take a 20 year old performance car and bring it up to current performance levels. And the first thing we need to do is clean this thing up and this thing is a mess. Wow. This is an example of some of the surprises you'll find in a used car. And you have some ski goggle lenses and some very creative sunglasses. And then some sort of science experiment, I think. <laughs> I'm not going to open that jar. Now, when most people say they want a performance car, they want something that'll smoke the tires and handle like a race car, like this. Unfortunately, not everybody can afford a hand-built car like this. But there is an alternative. Remember, these LS powered cars came with over 300 horsepower from the factory. And you can get a whole lot more than that with just a few upgrades. So smoking the tires on something like this is pretty easy. And that's half the equation. So today we're going to spend some time on the other half of the equation, this tired old suspension. See if we can't get this old red bird to handle more like that kind of car without spending a fortune. All right, when it comes to performance suspension parts, you've probably heard of BMR suspension. And what we have here is a whole bunch of stuff that's gonna make that F body handle like it's on rails. Now, first up are these new tubular upper and lower control arms. As you can see, they have urethane bushings, they've got new ball joints, they got heim joints, all the good stuff here. 
Then we have some lowering springs and some new adjustable Kona shocks. And these two components are going to work really well together. Then we have this massive front sway bar. And that's not all of it. We're also going to completely replace the stock cross member with this tubular unit. And that's the best thing about this BMR stuff. It's all designed to bolt in place of stock components, and each one of these fixes a factory weak spot. So the more you bolt on, the better the handling is going to be. Now, obviously, we're going to need to get underneath this car, but before we do that, there is some prep work that needs to happen here on the top side, like disconnecting the battery, pulling off this air box so we can get the alternator belt off. You'll find out why here in a minute. Also, you might need to unbolt the master cylinder to get access to these shock mounting bolts on the driver's side and remove this air conditioning line clamp on the passenger side. Doing this kind of stuff now avoids frustration once you're down underneath. Now, to do this kind of project, you only need to get the car about two feet in the air. So you can do this in your garage using floor jacks and jack stands. But if you have access to a lift, now is the time to use it, believe me. Hey, welcome back to Gears, where we are in the process of taking this old 98 Trans Am and turning it into a corner carving beast. Now, we've already got it prepped up and ready to go, so let's get back to it. The first thing we're gonna get rid of, those stock wheels and tires. Then unbolt the front sway bar. Now, you don't really notice how small this original bar is until you set it beside the new one. Wow. Okay, since pretty much everything needs to come off in here, the best thing to do is just start on the outside and work your way in. So obviously the brakes are the first thing to come off. Unless you're planning on upgrading the brakes, these will be reused. So make a note if they need to be rebuilt. The spindle is next, and you'll need to use a ball joint separator or pickle fork to knock the tie rod loose, then the upper and lower ball joints. Now, when you look at these old ball joints and tie rods, <laughs> you can see where a lot of that front end slop was coming from. Now, we will be reusing the spindle, so we'll do some cleanup on this. Also, it's a good time to check and make sure the bearings are good in the hub, because if they're bad, now's the time to replace that. The lower control arm is the next piece to come off, and it slides right out of the stock cross member. The last pieces to come out are the upper control arm and shock assembly, and they unbolt under the hood, and then the whole assembly comes out as one unit. Some of these components will be reused, so we're gonna set it aside. All right, with all the stock suspension components out of the way, now comes the tricky part, because now we need to remove that stock cross member. Now, the steering rack is bolted to the cross member, but we can't remove it yet because this driver's side bolt comes up and hits the oil pan. Thank you, GM. <laughs> so all we can do for now is just disconnect and cap the lines and then unbolt the steering shaft for later on when we lower the cross member down. Now looking at all of this wet residue on this original rack tells us that this probably needs to be replaced anyway. The motor mount bolts are next and on the driver's side, GM has another surprise for us. Right here, this motor mount bolt, you can see there is not enough room to remove that bolt without hitting the alternator. So the alternator needs to come off. 
That's why we took the belt off earlier. One final thing to look at are the brake lines and the tabs that need to be removed from the cross member before you take it off, because you don't want them hanging up when you lower this thing down. Also, these will be reused, so look them over close. If they're rusted or damaged, now's the time to replace them. All right, since we're gonna be removing this whole front cross member, we better do something to support the weight of the engine, or that whole thing's gonna come down on our head. So the best way to do that is just take a floor jack and a block of wood, put it underneath the oil pan, and take the weight of the motor off the cross member. Finally, we'll unbolt the cross member and remove it. This gives you an idea of how big and clunky this original cross member is compared to the new lighter, stronger tubular cross member. We have definitely removed a boat anchor from the front of this car. Now, the benefit of this cross member is not just better rigidity, it also reduces weight and it gives us much needed clearance to work on things or add headers or turbos or whatever else we want to do down the road. It's also the perfect base for all that cool red stuff on the table. All right, the upper control arms are the first thing we're going to deal with. And as you can see, there's quite a difference between the new tubular upper control arms and these stocked stamp steel ones. Now, these were notorious for twisting and flexing under hard cornering. And of course, these rubber bushings will eventually go bad and crack on you. These are not gonna twist and flex, and with the greasable urethane bushings, those will pretty much last forever. Now, this piece here is the stock piece. As you can see, we had to put a little POR15 on this to stop the rust that was happening on here. And now, the new control arm will slide right into this and utilize the stock hardware. Just make sure you grease the bushings before you do it. Now, the stock spring and shock come together as a strut assembly. And as you can see, take a look at the top here. They are notorious for rusting up here, making it really hard to get these things apart. And then, of course, you have to have a spring compressor to do that anyway. So, we're not going to mess with that. What you need to do is go down to your local auto parts store, pick up a new strut mount, and then just bolt the spring and the shock together, no spring compressor required. Now, one thing to look at here, this is the difference between aftermarket and OEM. Notice the location of the little rubber nub here. <laughs> it's not the same. And that little nub is supposed to come up into this locator hole. So what might happen is if this does not fit through the hole, it can ball up like this and keep the strut from mounting flush against the bottom of the bracket. You don't want that. So if it's not going to fit through the hole, just take a razor blade and cut that little nub off of there. Now, another cool thing about these Coney shocks is that they are adjustable. You'll just need to take a little Allen wrench and it goes right in here and then you can rotate this over and you have about nine different settings here. So you can dial in the performance you want out of your shock. With it all together, the whole shock and spring assembly, as well as the upper control arm, mounts into the car utilizing the factory holes. The adjustable tubular lower control arms are next, and they slide in place using the factory hardware. And just like the uppers, they also utilize urethane bushings in the front and a heim joint in the rear for quick adjustment and no deflection under hard cornering. With the new control arms and strut assembly in place, now it's just a matter of installing the stock spindle to the new ball joints. Now, with all these new parts bolted in place, you can see how quickly we have changed the front suspension to something that's far superior than what came from the factory. Now, if you're gonna keep the stock brakes and wheels and tires, you can put those back on now. If you're gonna replace the steering rack and the alternator, now's the time to do that as well. But before you bolt the rest of these parts back on, there are some details that you need to take care of underneath here. Remember, you just removed a massive cross member from underneath this car. And that cross member had a bunch of wiring and brake lines attached to it. And now the lines are just hanging out, wondering where to go. And the temptation for you is gonna be just to 
tuck them up out of the way and jerry-rig it with tape or wire ties or whatever so you can drive down the road. And that is not safe enough for a daily driver and it won't pass the inspection on most racetracks either. So make sure you spend some time rerouting wiring and brake lines and properly clamping them to the body or the new cross member so it not only looks good when you crawl under here, but you don't have issues down the road with burnt wiring or crushed brake lines. Then once all that's done, you can finish putting it together. And now it's time for another quick tip. When you're working on a project and you're getting ready to put on some new parts, you got everything all torn down, now is the perfect time to do a little maintenance work on some things you might have been procrastinating on. And that's today's quick tip. I'm talking about things like leaky power steering hoses or leaky exhaust systems, or in our case, a leaky oil pan gasket, because you're never going to get better access to fixing all this stuff. Now, I know you're going to be in a hurry. You got all this cool stuff on the table. And the last thing you're going to want to do is do some general maintenance. But I promise you, if you don't do it now, you're going to regret it. Because once you get everything back together, you go down to the cool event and your nicely built car is going to leak oil all over the place. You're going to wish you did this. So remember, there's an old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It definitely applies here. If you'd like to learn more tips to make your life easier in the shop, check out the tips page on the website. And now, Parts Bin. There is no doubt that the full-size Jeep trucks are popular. From the J-Series civilian trucks to the military M715 version, they are one of the most rugged, tough trucks ever built. The problem is, parts are getting hard to find. And most of these full-size Jeeps, especially these M715s, they're really low geared, so they're kind of a pain to drive on the highway. Well, fortunately, there is BJ's Off-Road because they not only carry all kinds of parts for full-size Jeeps, but also gear sets for the M715. Take a look. This is a 456 gear set for the front Dana 60 and a matching 456 gear set for the rear Dana 70. Now, as you can see, you've got new ring and pinion. You've got all the bearings. You've got the hardware. You've got the shims. You've got the slingers. You've got the carrier bearings. We even got some new yokes so we can upgrade those. And since the factory gears are 587s, putting 456s in this is going to make it much better driving down the highway. It's the best thing you can do other than swapping and complete new axles. So if you have a full-size Jeep, whether it's a Wagoneer or a J truck or an M715, and you want to keep it stock or modify it, BJ's Off-Road's got the parts you need. You know, one thing that's great about the automotive aftermarket is that there are always new and innovative products being developed all the time. And nowhere is that more evident than in the braking systems. And I'm not just talking about high performance brakes for your hot rod or street machine or race car. No, I'm talking about your daily driver. Take a look. This is Bayer's Extreme Force front disc brake system for the 2002 through 18 Dodge Ram 1500 truck. Now, as you can see, the kit starts with these massive 15 inch rotors. They're a two piece design but they're already put together with heavy duty stainless steel hardware, so you don't have to mess with that. Then you've got these huge six, count them, six piston calipers to give you tremendous clamping force. Then of course you have the mounting brackets and hardware to put these things in. Now this system will fit a 19 inch or larger rim and you can get these calipers powder coated in a lot of different colors so you can color match it to your vehicle. Now, I know you're probably thinking, ah, this looks like an exotic racing system. <laughs> well, the racing part is right because racing is in Bear's background. But exotic, nah. This is designed to bolt right in place of your stock brakes, utilizing pads and parts that are easily accessible. So you get the clamping force of a racing system without the cost. And Bear makes these for Ford, Chevy, and Dodge trucks, as well as other vehicles. So check them out.
What are you working on? Brought to you by Woodward Fabrication, selling quality metalworking equipment since 1966. Today's What Are You Working On comes from Matt from Indiana, and his project is a 1947 Ford Coupe. Take a look at this thing. Yeah, that's a nice project. Now, he said he'd been looking for a project to do with his son, and he found this old Ford sitting by a gas station next to his house. So he grabbed as much cash as he could, headed down to see if he could work a deal. Now, he said the bad part about the car, take a look at this. It had been sitting in a barn with a back end sitting outside the wall. So needless to say, the car was a complete basket case. He said he had to find a new frame. He had to repair all the sheet metal from six inches down all the way around, the rockers, the quarters. And he said so far, he has boxed the chassis. He's put on a new front independent suspension. And he's put a rebuilt 289 in it with a five-speed manual. Very cool. And uh, take a look at this. He's custom made the, the clutch and brake pedals out of a Jeep. He custom built the dash. Man, this guy's been doing a lot of work on this thing. Now at this point, the car is up and driving and he says he gets to go out to car shows and that gives him a lot of motivation to finish the project. So how long has he been working on it? He said he's been working on it for 10 years and obviously it's been a budget build, but he's getting closer every day and he's just loving it. So. Great project, man. So to recognize that cool 47 project, we hooked up with our buddies at Woodward Fab. We're gonna give you one of these shears. I'm sure you could have used that when you were doing some of that sheet metal work, but at least you have it now for your next project. Also, we're gonna give you one of these project planning books so you can keep track of everything you're doing on that project. We're gonna give you a gift card from Holly so you can get some products to help you out. And we're gonna give you one of our Gears t-shirts because obviously you are a real gearhead. We're going to finish it up with a little Sergeant Rock die cast. Now for the rest of you guys, if you want to get in on this, get your project featured on the show, man, you got to send it to us. Go to our website, go to Gears Nation and submit it into What Are You Working On? The website's also the place to find out more information on any products you may have seen on the show, any Gears merchandise, and how to join Gears Nation. Now, being a Gears Nation member gives you access to our new app through Android and iOS, where you can watch all of our Gears content commercial free. Also, don't forget to check us out on Amazon Prime for Gears and the Restoration Series. Finally, don't forget to like us on Facebook and Instagram so you can get some behind the scenes footage on our weekly web series, Shifting Gears. And if you're a radio person, make sure you check out our new podcast, Tales of a Gearhead. All right, that wraps it up for us today. Hopefully you have a project to get out there and work on. If you don't, they're out there. They're in back alleys, they're in garages, they're in classified ads, they're at the auctions. There is something out there that would be perfect for you to get out and crank some wrenches on. So get to it. We'll see you next time.